Hello and welcome back to the Reapers. Today we're in our F14B Tomcat and we're looking at our AN ALR67 RWR radar warning receiver. First of all, a bit of background. The RWR is designed to inform and alert the F14B crew about radar emitters in the AO. It's also designed to help the crew defend themselves from hostile threats by indicating radar tracking and engagement by radar guided weapons. And some background from the flight manual, the RWR was integrated into the F14B Tomcat as part of the A-plus upgrade program and the final B version. And at first it was implemented as a standalone system. The RWR is however connected to the an ALQ-126, which is the DECM jamming suite, allowing it to send info on threats and emitters to the jammer directly and also display jammed targets on its own display. As well as that, it's linked to the AN ALE-39 countermeasure suite and it can actively trigger pre-programmed countermeasure programs of chaff if set up correctly on the ALE-39. And we saw an example of this in the previous ALE-39 countermeasure video that we did. On later F-14B models incorporating the PTID upgrade, the RWR was also integrated to the MDIG displays, allowing for a better threat picture on the ECMD, the Electronic Counters Measure Display. The technicalities are the RWR on the F-14B has four small spiral high-band antennas, four wide-band high-band quadrant receivers, and a low-band array. Connected to these antennas is a narrow-band superheterodyne receiver analyzing the received signals and indicating emitters and threats to both pilot and the Rio using two displays, each of them the same, and by audio signals played to them through their headset by the ICS intercommunication system. So the first thing we're going to look at is the main control panel and this is viewed by the Rio. So this down here, I'm framing the RWR panel here. So the first thing is power off or on, so obviously it's on to, for it to work. And we've also got a volume control for the audio signals it sends to the Rio's headset. Now the pilot also gets these signals, but the volume for him is controlled by a volume knob on his volume slash TACAN command panel. We have a test button here that we can switch. It's spring-loaded to the center, but we can temporarily split it up to special and down to bit. Bit is built in test, but we're not gonna dwell on the test. We next have the display mode switch. Again, this is spring-loaded to the center. So if I can press and hold it, and I can go to offset, and then when I release it goes back to the center. And I can also press the other mouse button to go to limit, and then let go and it goes to the center. So in the center, it just shows the normal display of the RWR, and we'll go through that in a bit. Offset out of interest, if we press and hold that, will separate the RWR threat symbols so that just in case they are on top of each other, which is quite common if you're in a radar rich environment, they often uh, appear on top of each other. So the offset will force them to be separated in terms of azimuth to basically make it easier to view them. And the limit will temporarily change the maximum amount of symbols shown on the RWR display down to six. So this is a way of decluttering and it will choose those six as the six most high priority threats. Note that only the Rio has this panel, so only the Rio can do this. And then we've got the display type knob here. So the default position is normal. In this case, an N is indicated in the middle ring of the RWR display. We'll have a proper look at the display in a minute, but you can see we've got the N there, so it's in normal mode. And in normal mode, it prioritizes the threats by a default library that it has pro programmed into it. Then we have AI, this is Airborne Interceptor. If we have it on AI mode, then we will have an I in the middle of the ring here to tell it's in AI mode. And then it will prioritize all Airborne Interceptor targets above other threats. Then we have AAA mode, so again, same thing. If we turn it to that, we will have an A in the middle threat ring here, and it will prioritize all AAA threats above other threats. Unknown, very similar, you will have a U in the middle of the threat ring and it will prioritize unknown threats. Unknown threats could be, well, anything that's unknown. Uh, so this works by having a library of radar reception signals and it compares the uh, signals that it's receiving from these guys here and looks them up on its table. And you can see that is an SA-6, that's a MiG-29, that is a, I think that's a Grisha type frigate. But if it couldn't find one of these guys in the library, it will come up as a U for unknown. And same thing with friend here. If we press friend, we will get an F in the middle threat ring and it would prioritize any friends above hostiles. And that could be useful for obvious reasons. So next we're gonna take a closer look at the display here. To do that, I'm gonna actually remove that MiG-29 because that's gonna cause us trouble. So stand by as I reload in. 
Okay, we're back in now. So we've got the same threats. We've got the creature type frigate there. We've got the SA-6 there. And we've replaced the MiG-29 with an S-300 suite here, which is just going to give us some more time to talk. So first of all, we need to look at the threat wings. So the closer the symbol is to the center on some RWRs represents the distance or the signal strength to us. In the F-14, it doesn't do that. This is a threat-based system like in the F-18 and the Harrier. So we've got three rings, one, two, and three. One is non-lethal. That means that this guy here is painting us, but he's not considered lethal, not in firing range or even tracking range. Then there is the lethal band, the middle one here. So the SA-6 and the Grecia are in this band. This means that these guys are capable of locking us up, tracking us at the moment, but currently they're not. Currently they are still just painting us. If they then locked us up and or fired a missile at us, then they would go into the critical band, which is outside here. Note that during the service life of the F-14B, the order of these bands changed several times. So if you look up the history of the F-14B, it may show it the other way around. Next in the middle here is the status circle here. So currently we were talking about uh, these guys here. So we can see it's currently in N, I, A, U, or F, depending on which threat mode we have set. And we can also show better these guys here now. So if I want to limit, press and hold, left click there. It won't actually reduce the amount of threats because there's only three, it reduces them down to six. But we can see we've got the L sign there showing both crew members that we have the limit on. And if we right click and hold, then you can see that we have the offset with the O there. And you can see in this case it's offset the uh, Big Bird and the clamshell, which are two types of radar that the S300 has. Will also let us know if it's doing a built-in test with a B, a Bravo in there. Also, T for Tango means that the system is overheated. So that's something that can happen. And as well as that, it will inform us in the center here if there is a failure of the system. Note also that there's a brightness knob here, which we can change by uh, left click and drag, or we can use mouse scroll. And also to show that if we go into the pilot seat, we've also got an identical display here. Needless to say, the azimuth, so the direction that they are on this gauge here, shows whereabouts, which direction the radar is coming from. So this guy here is on our 1 o'clock, that's on our 1 o'clock, and that's on our 10 to 11 o'clock. If it was back here, it would be on our 6 o'clock. The system displays azimuth only, it does not display range, and it does not display altitude. If we look a little more closely, we can see that the uh, GZ, the boat, the Grisha type frigate, has a U sign underneath it. That means it is a vessel, a boat. There will be other changes to the symbols here, but we will go through that when we move the tutorial on. Before we go any further, I will now show you a quick snapshot of all of the different symbols that are available, and then you can freeze frame that if you like. As well as the RWR displays, the pilot and the Rio also have warning lights available. So for the pilot, it's up here. So we've got three lights that we're interested in. We've got SAM here, so it's saying that it's currently detecting surface-to-air radar emissions. So these essentially are all SAMs. If there was a radar guided AAA detected, we would get a AAA in the middle. And if there was an air interceptor, i.e. an aircraft radar detected, then we would get AI here. We get something similar if we go back to the Rio on the right of the TID here. And if I bring up an overlay just out of interest, we have IFF here. We have received transmit of the jammer, the inbuilt jammer here. We have the SAM threat here of the RWR, the AAA threat here of the RWR. A continuous wave threat here of the RWR and an air intercept, an aircraft, here. Now as well as all these visual displays, we also have audio warnings that are piped into our headsets through the ICS. A single short tone is used to indicate the presence of a new emitter or when a threat has moved to another threat band. A slow warbling alternating tone is used to indicate the presence of a threat in a critical band. A fast warbling alternating tone is used to indicate a threat is actively engaging our own aircraft, i.e. Uh, firing a missile. And a special four tone audio signal with pitch decreasing with each tone is used to indicate a special event as programmed by the threat library. In this case, it represents a new threat tied to a system capable of silently engaging our own aircraft, i.e. it can engage our aircraft without causing its threat symbol to move to the critical band on the RWR display and thus no additional warning audio warning tones will be given. In this case the threat would be either an aircraft with a track while scan lock which will not alert our system or a SAM system that can guide its missiles by other means than radar and thus not giving further warnings of active engagement. 
So now that we've gone through the controls, the symbology and audiology, the only thing is to go and um, actually use the system in practice. So we're going to unpause now. Now one thing I'd like to point out at this time is that there is a blind spot in the system. So the system essentially listens in front of it, to the left, to the right and behind us and kind of upper angles are roughly about 45 degrees and down to about 45 degrees but below those 45 degrees and above those 45 degrees it's blind so for instance if an aircraft uh, locked us from up there where the sun is and fired a missile down at us we could not detect that it would not show on the system uh, so that is something to bear in mind what we're going to do now is we're going to speed time up, we're going to move forwards and see these threats change and listen to the audiology as we get closer. 12 o'clock. Right, here we go. So, just to quiet that down a second, you'll see that the SA6 has moved into the critical band, so it's now scanning us, it's now got a lock, or you could call that spiking us, so it's now, although it's not fired a missile yet, it is capable of firing a missile, so it's in the critical band. The Grisha is still considered lethal, but it's not locked us, and the Big Bird still hasn't done anything yet, so let's carry on. Okay, and we have a missile launch. Sorry, it's just too noisy. We've got a missile launch, and we know that because this guy is flashing here, so we know it's a radar-guided missile. I should say semi-active radar-guided missile, and the reason I say that is because that's a missile without its own radar. So we're going to continuously get the launch warning here from where the actual radar station is on the ground. Note that if it was a FOX-3 type missile, a fully active missile with its own radar, then assuming that missile had gone pitbull, then the sign that we'd be getting on here would be the actual missile itself rather than the aircraft. So that's something to bear in mind. Let's push on. And we've got our symbology beeping up here. Okay, probably it's under dodge now. Now, interestingly, it's put the SA-6 back here in the lethal but not critical band. So that's telling us that it's not got a lock on us anymore and that missile is dumped. And let's just have a quick check. I'm not completely convinced that's true. Oh, yes, it has. The missile has indeed been defeated and it's blown up and we've broken the lock. And the reason we broke the lock is just by our orientation. We beamed the radar. And, uh, and broke the lock. We've got a high distance of about 20 miles. Now, the only other thing to point out is when we were turned, so our belly was towards the hostile radar, I was expecting us to lose a complete track of the SA-6 on this RWR. On any of the other aircraft in DCS, that would have happened. It didn't happen in the F-14. I don't know why that is. I guess there are two reasons. One, either it's just not modeled that accurately on this current model, or this may have a special kind of RWR that can actually look downwards or upwards. That goes past the limit of my knowledge, so I don't know which it is. So if anyone else, else knows about that, then please let me know. And just a tiny little thing there, you see it's got two GZs. Now I know that there's only one GZ Grisha out there, uh, so you can see it's, it's, it's got a little bit confused. There may be one a radar transmission uh, coming directly to us, and another radar transmission bouncing off a house or something and hitting us and fooling us and thinking there's two. It's just a, a kind of cool thing that can happen. That's all I've got to say on the RWR. It's a really good system. It's a shame it's only operated from the uh, Rio, but that's just how it is. I hope that helps and see you later.